Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Another residential school tragedy as the bodies of more than 200 Indigenous children are found in a grave in B.C. The Alberta government announces $45 million to support young students who were negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we hear from Lethbridge East MLA Nathan Newdorf, who gives us his thoughts on the three Alberta pastors who were arrested during the pandemic. Your nation, your province, your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The former chief of a BC First Nation says the discovery of the remains of 215 children shows the painful legacy of residential schools is not over yet. Many jewels of the Kamloops to Shaw Weapon First Nation says the children who died at the Kamloops school should have been buried with dignity and not in unmarked graves. The First Nation's current chief, Roseanne Casimir, says work to identify the site was led by its language and cultural department alongside ceremonial knowledge keepers. The school operated between 1890 and 1969. It was once the largest residential school system in all of Canada. The Alberta government announced today that it will be increasing funding to support Indigenous tourism experiences across the province. Officials say the three-year funding initiative will help Indigenous entrepreneurs expand their skills, leading to new business development and employment. As part of Budget 2021 through Travel Alberta, Indigenous Alberta will receive $1.2 million this year, $1.25 million in 2022-2023, and $1.3 million in 2023-2024. Government officials say Indigenous tourism in Alberta is worth just over $166 million while creating around 3,000 jobs across the province. The Indigenous Recovery Coach Program was started in 2018 as a response to help those in the Indigenous community who have been struggling with addiction. Now, some of that help includes traditional healing practices. The Recovery Centre supports those who are battling opioid addictions. Now, the head of the Recovery Coach Program, Jermaine Wells, says the goal is not for harm reduction but for solid recovery. Harm reduction um, is in the first stages of recovery. We are covering all stages of recovery. And that first stage, we aren't equipped to provide the harm reduction services. So we do referral out to those organizations within Lethbridge that are providing those services. Um, and we work on referrals both ways. Um, and so relapse is a part of recovery. So in the event that a relapse happens, we are able to support our clients to move them to the services they need when it comes to harm reduction. And they're re able to refer them back to us when they're at the later stage of recovery. Well, says all of the staff from the program are Indigenous. Beginning June 1st, personal services like hair and aesthetics can open once again in the province. Now these business owners have been asked to close and reopen three times since the pandemic began. Sheer Persuasion Salon and Spa in Lethbridge will be opening their doors next week. And as Ainsley O'Reilly explains, they're hoping it's for the long haul. One may not think about what went on behind the scenes for salon owners during the continued closures. Booking, cancelling and rescheduling became the norm. Hair and aesthetics businesses like Sheer Persuasion in Lethbridge are hoping that when they open their doors June 1st, it's for good. Back to work, not doing the closure and then it's really busy trying to get everybody back in every time. So we're, we're hoping that this is the last time. Personal services are already under stringent requirements when it comes to health and safety. But many will keep routines that began during the pandemic of washing chairs, sinks and the waiting area between every customer. Something that we've done since the beginning and we will probably continue to do for forever. Forced into our homes for more than a year, stylists are realizing just how important their services are. Your hair and the aesthetics and everything like that is actually so much more important than people realize. It is. Um, a lot of people see it as vanity, but I think that I have realized during this time how important it actually is um, to people's mental health and self-esteem in general. You, you know, you get your hair done, you feel bomb, you can, you know, walk around with your head a little higher. And in less than one week... We're just happy to be here for everybody behind the chair doing what we do best. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. Lethbridge City Hall will be reopening in a limited capacity on Monday. Officials say the reopening of City Hall is due to the decline of active COVID cases and the uptake of vaccination of locals. Even though City Hall is reopening, residents are still, however, encouraged to make online and telephone inquiries. 
City officials say utility and tax payments can be made at the city, but also at your bank. Streaming media has become a go-to for many Lethbridge residents during the pandemic. In 2014, the Lethbridge Public Library brought forth a streaming platform called Hoopla to allow anyone who has a library card to be able to access many titles. Jonathan Jarvie from the Lethbridge Public Library says they average around 2,000 items borrowed each and every month. Hoopla is one of the digital resources available through the Lethbridge Public Library. Uh, it allows uh, patrons to borrow uh, ebooks, audiobooks, and a wide variety of uh, resources, and they can either stream it on their browser on your home computer, or if you want, you can download the Hoopla app, and it allows you to either stream or download directly to your uh, device. So you, you can watch movies while you're camping and it happens to be raining, or anytime when you're on the go. Jarvie says there are around 30 people signing up for Hoopla every month. The Canadian Collegiate Esports League will be launching a gaming tournament for university students. The CCEL is a competitive gaming industry that showcases students from over 13 post-secondary schools throughout Canada, including the University of Lethbridge. The schools will battle each other in matches to determine which school will win the prizes. Bill Dever, the Chief Strategy Officer for Harina Data, says this tournament teaches students the value of human interaction during a time when the pandemic has isolated so many people. It's interesting with all these tools of connectivity, we are becoming an increasingly distant from each other's society. And I think it's important that we counter that and we counter it by using tools like this to work collectively. You know, the, the biggest special effect, if the movie, if the world was a movie, is other people. And it's, it's really important that we connect, bond, with other people. The tournament will kick off on May the 29th. It is National Hamburger Day, and where better to sample some unique creations than Dylan's Burgers and Piggyback Poutinery in downtown Lethbridge. BCN visited the restaurant Friday and learned about some of their unique burger patty combinations. It's all about the bacon. So yeah, our, our blend is we do, we grind bacon and beef in house, and we do a 30% bacon blend with our, on our burgers. So. And then plus a whole bunch of bacon on top as well. We don't have the bacon patty. We don't actually don't do 100% beef patty. We did that. It's not, it's not for us. A little bit too dry, so we don't do that. Today, for tonight, uh, we're going to be doing lamb. So we do cycle through burgers, uh, a few different ones. We've done elk quite a bit. We've done lamb previously. We've done kangaroo. We've kind of worked our way through some specialty burgers over the course of time. The UCP announced that it will be providing up to $45 million in new funding to help support students who need extra help with literacy and numeracy following two years of pandemic-impacted learning. Officials say the targeted programming is based on feedback from superintendents from school divisions and how to best support early learners. Literacy and numeracy are woven throughout all subjects and grades in the draft curriculum. Altogether, this investment the reading assessments and the new draft curriculum demonstrate Alberta's commitment to students and to providing them with a strong foundation of essential knowledge and skills to succeed in the future. The Alberta government also announced that another 60 physician clinics will soon begin vaccinating patients as our province's vaccine rollout continues. More than 2.6 million doses have now been administered in Alberta through AHS, pharmacies and physician clinics. Each clinic will contact their patients who are eligible for vaccination. The clinics will offer the Moderna vaccine with around 8,200 doses expected to be administered by family physicians and staff. Alberta Justice Minister Casey Medu has had some time now to read through the plan that Lethbridge Police Chief Shaheen Medizade put forward, outlining how the Lethbridge Police Service will improve moving forward. The LPS has been under the fire and under the microscope over the past few years, dealing with certain issues, including more transparency. Now, we asked Lethbridge East MLA Nathan Newdorf if he's had a chance to chat with Minister Madhu and get his thoughts on the plan submitted by the Lethbridge Police Chief. I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, the Minister of Justice uh, has accepted that plan. There are elements in it that he wants to absolutely ensure are addressed and looked at and, and identified and, and then managed and acted upon. So he continues to work with Chief Medizade and the Lethbridge Police Service, but I believe that we are heading in a very good direction and uh, addressing some very needed issues for, uh, for Lethbridge. MLA Nathan Newdorf will also discuss how the province is moving forward with a plan to tackle the drug crisis here in Lethbridge. That Q&A is coming up 
later in our broadcast. The case by Alberta Health Services against a Calgary pastor will not be going to a hearing. The Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms announced today that because AHS never served Pastor Tim Stevens from Fairview Baptist Church with a court order he was accused of having violated, the contempt of court charges were dropped. Pastor Tim spent three days in the Calgary Remand Centre before his lawyers could secure his release. Pastor Stevens has also been ticketed several times for breaking public health orders. Up to 50 people can now attend indoor faith services in British Columbia as long as the facility has a detailed COVID-19 safety plan. Health officials say the updated guidance has been posted about how services and gatherings can be started again safely. As we're in this bridging period where we're still um, uh, having constraints on numbers and other uh, activities, particularly indoors, it has provisions for things like masking, etc. It does allow for um, small uh, funerals and baptisms as part of a religious service, but not at the moment uh, for weddings. Those attending interfaith services must stay two metres apart from others unless they're from the same household and masks must always be worn. Uh, people also need to pre-register with their contact information. Manitoba is extending a ban on social gatherings for another two weeks with COVID-19 hospitalizations expected to climb. The ban on indoor and outdoor gatherings, with a small exception for those who live alone, will remain in place until June the 12th. Manitobans uh, must stay home as much as possible over the next uh, two weeks so that our hospitals and our medical teams have the capacity to care for Manitobans. Uh, have the ability to care for people when they need that help. Not just COVID patients, but others as well, uh, many of whom have been waiting uh, for medical treatments. Uh, so this means for the next two weeks, uh, no indoor or outdoor gatherings with members outside your household. And this includes all recreation spaces. This includes playgrounds, golf courses, parks, sports fields, um, campgrounds as well. As for public school students in both Winnipeg and Brandon, they'll have to continue remote learning until the week of June the 7th. Conservative foreign affairs critic Michael Chong says Prime Minister Justin Trudeau conflated criticism of China with anti-Asian racism in his response to questions over alleged ties between the Chinese military and a lab in Winnipeg. The Liberals say they will not give in to pandering to anti-Asian racism. Yesterday, in response to questions about China's threats to Canada and the government's Winnipeg lab, the Prime Minister suggested that simply by asking these questions, we were fomenting anti-Asian racism. Does the Prime Minister realize that when he conflates criticism of China with anti-Asian racism, he plays to Beijing's propaganda? For example, China accused Canada and its allies of white supremacy simply for calling for the release of Mr. Kovrig and Mr. Spaver two years ago. When will the Prime Minister quit playing into Beijing's hand and answer questions about the government's Winnipeg lab. The employees in question at the Winnipeg lab are no longer there and uh, we are not at liberty to provide any more details at this point. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he supports U.S. President Joe Biden to thoroughly investigate the origins of COVID-19. Biden ordered U.S. intelligence officials to redouble their efforts to investigate, including the possibility the trail may lead to a Chinese laboratory. From the beginning of this pandemic, we've worked with the international community uh, to find answers. Uh, we support uh, the, uh, the call by the United States and others uh, to better understand the origins of uh, COVID-19, uh, not just ins to ensure accountability, but also to make sure we fully understand how to better protect the world going forward uh, from any such further pandemics. Uh, I know there are a lot of theories out there, uh, but we need to make sure we're getting to a full and complete airing of the facts to actually understand uh, what happened and how to make sure it never happens again. You know, many governments have been under the microscope during the COVID-19 pandemic, including our federal government, and in particular, the Liberals' vaccine rollout. For this week's poll question, we asked you, we're now more than a year into the pandemic. With what political party do your loyalties lie? Around 47% of you voted for the Conservative Party of Canada. 32% of you went with the other category, around 19% with the New Democratic Party, and only 2% of you voted for the Liberals, and the Green Party didn't garner any votes. Make sure you log on to bridgecitynews.ca again on Monday for our next poll question. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he will attend the G7 Leaders Summit in person next month. Trudeau and British PM Boris Johnson says the two agreed that Canada and the UK are aligned on foreign policy goals. 
The readout of a call between the two leaders says they will apply that unity to the challenges discussed during the summit. That includes increasing global access to COVID-19 vaccines, tackling climate change and improving gender equality in girls' education. Canada's expert advisory panel of vaccines says increased supply of COVID-19 vaccines means that people should be offered a second dose as soon as possible. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization says priority for second doses should be given to those who are highest risk. The group also issued new guidance recommending that those who are pregnant, breastfeeding, or have an autoimmune condition be vaccinated against COVID-19. It says mRNA vaccines such as Pfizer and Moderna are preferred for pregnant people. Well, it was a great day for flying a kite here in Lethbridge. Lots of wind once again, but fairly mild. And there's a slight chance of some moisture, then a great weekend is shaping up. Full weather details are on deck. We had wind gusts up to 70 kilometers an hour again today. I guess there's a reason why they call Lethbridge the Windy City. Jeanette Roche is back with a complete look at our weather forecast. Jeanette, hold on to your hat, but not so much because of the wind, but because a great weekend is shaping up. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a good one, Helen. I am so happy to report that it, so far it looks like not too much wind this weekend. Those wind gusts going to remain this evening, though. We do have a risk of a thunderstorm overnight tonight, overnight low six degrees into tomorrow, Saturday, like I was saying, increasing sun uh, in the morning throughout the day, 19 degrees the high and then from here on out we're just getting warmer and warmer look at these temperatures 25 on sunday 28 on monday tuesday we're looking at 29 degrees and a high of 32 degrees on wednesday uh, closing out the seven day forecast on thursday with 29 degrees so finally we are back in those summer time of uh, summer like temperatures for sure, especially when you consider the average high for this time of year is 20 degrees, six degrees, the average low 33 was our high temperature back in 1986. And in 1947, we had our chilliest day on record, which was minus five. 5.32 a.m. is when the sun rose this morning, sunset this evening, 9.26 p.m., giving us uh, close to 16 hours of daylight. Over on the west coast tomorrow, we're looking at sunny skies in both Victoria and Vancouver, highs of 20 and 17 degrees. Both of those cities going to have some foggy patches in the morning that will dissipate throughout the day. 19 degrees the high in Edmonton and 18 in Calgary. Both of those cities, a sunshine, 20 kilometer per hour winds, so not too bad at all. As we look to the rest of the prairies, Saskatoon's high 20 degrees, 19 in Regina. Regina looking at a chance of showers. Showers also expected tomorrow in Winnipeg with a high of 20 degrees. Looking at some wind gusts too from 40 to 60 K. Over in Toronto, this is where we're gonna be seeing uh, more wind. This actually, actually, this whole area is gonna be quite gusty tomorrow. 15 degrees the high in Toronto. Sunny skies though, 18 in Ottawa with sunshine as well. Montreal 18 and sunny skies as well. As we look to Atlantic Canada, let's see what's going on in the Maritimes. 13 degrees the high in Fredericton. Mix of sun and cloud. Halifax expecting rain tomorrow up to five millimeters. 11 degrees the high, 11 in Charlottetown as well. And St. John's Newfoundland sunshine, 13 degrees the high for tomorrow. So there you have it. Happy weekend, everybody. Construction has begun on a 2.6 kilometer tunnel in Burnaby, BC for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. The company says work on the tunnel connecting the Westridge Marine and Burnaby terminals began this week. It says the start of the tunnel construction represents a major component of the expansion project in the Lower Mainland. It's expected to take just over six months to complete. The company said the expansion project is on budget and on schedule for completion by the end of 2022. The head of Alberta's energy regulator says new rules coming this fall will force oil and gas companies to spend a certain amount to clean up abandoned wells. Lori Pusher says the changes will make a big difference in an effort to clean up a massive backlog of inactive oil and gas wells. Pusher says the plan to collect cleanup payments toward the end of the mine's life will answer criticism that Alberta's environment is not adequately protected. He says the Alberta Energy Regulator has had a tough year, but after budget cuts, still has the resources to do the job that Albertans expect. When it comes to agriculture, we hear many stories of farmers who are retiring. Is there a new crop of young farmers and producers who are ready to take over? We posed that question to Caitlin Dubin, host of a weekly podcast called Wild Rose Farmer. She says when it comes to attracting younger people to the farming industry, it's not easy. 
when I think about my husband, he would be the third generation on this farm and he never left. Like this was what he was going to do. He knew he was going to be a farmer, but friends of his that grew up in the neighborhood per se, they moved on to do careers outside of agriculture. And I feel like a lot of friends his age now are more getting back interested into it. And I don't know if it was because of the pandemic and the food shortages and all of that kind of stuff, but I feel like there is just a lot of things against younger people coming into agriculture. It's hard work. You have to have the capital behind you. I don't know how people without you know, the ties and connections would ever be able to afford to purchase land in Southern Alberta, like irrigated land, it would be nearly impossible unless you have the capital to back you up. Stats Canada says from 2016 to 2017, average total income for farm families operating a single farm in Canada averaged just over $166,500. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 77 points on the day to finish at 19,852. The Dow was up 64 points to 34,529. The S&P 500 was up 3 points to 4,204. And the NASDAQ was up 12 points on the day to 13,749. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 53 cents to 66.32 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 3 cents to 2.99 US. Gold was up 7.23 to 1903.77 US an ounce. And silver was up 9 cents to 27.94 US an ounce. Wheat is at $338 per metric ton. Barley's at $344. The November futures for canola was $891. And corn is at $403 per metric ton. Live cattle were down 48 cents to $115.88. Feeder cattle were down $1.50 to $151.35 and lean hogs were up $1.53 to $117.25. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 82.80 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, the Alberta government announced that another 60 physician clinics will soon begin vaccinating patients as our province's vaccine rollout continues. More than 2.6 million doses have now been administered in Alberta through AHS, pharmacies and physician clinics. Each clinic will contact their patients who are eligible for vaccination. Coming up, a one-on-one -on -one interview with Lethbridge East MLA Nathan Newdorf, who will talk about some of the biggest issues affecting our region and how the Alberta government is helping businesses as we slowly come out of the pandemic. As you've heard on Bridge City News, the provincial government announced it's open for summer plans with the hope that Alberta will be fully reopened for business by July. To talk about this in more detail is Lethbridge East MLA, Nathan Newdorf. Nathan, welcome back to Bridge City News. Glad to be here, Hal. So how did Premier Kenny come up with mid-June for Stage 2 and then a couple of weeks later fully reopen for our province? Sure. He, this is very much science-based, as you would probably know, once you get your vaccination, your shot, it takes about two weeks for that to take full effect. So given the numbers that we're at literally today at 50% of our population and we see our hospitalizations and ICUs down, those people that got their shots today in two weeks will have that effectiveness up to the place where we need it to be to make sure those protections are in place. And then in the next two weeks, as those people get their shots, Four weeks from now, they'll be at uh, the level of immunity that we need them to be at where we can reopen. So very much science-based, very much just allowing those vaccinations to take place and uh, seeing our numbers continue to drop really puts us in a good place to open safely and effectively for our businesses and our communities. Now, Nathan, some doctors are saying it's too much too soon, especially when it comes to large crowds and the potential of catching COVID-19 is much greater. How do you respond to that? Well, I, I look around the world. I look at lots of other jurisdictions that have hit these thresholds of vaccinations. They, they've been through the spikes just like we have. And I look at them opening up now. They're slightly warmer. They're slightly ahead of us in terms of that. But we've taken a very cautious approach by watching what they've done. Many jurisdictions in the United States is opening without seeing spikes. They're going very, very well. They've had lots of people at different uh, entertainment venues or professional sports venues without those outbreaks. The UK has seen a similar approach work very well for them. So we've really take, taken uh, notes out of their, their playbook, tried to follow the same thing. We're quite confident with the warmer weather, with these restrictions that we've had for so long, 
with our vaccination rollout leading the nation, we're quite comfortable that we're going to hit these targets and, and be able to open up for a great summer. You know, and I know a lot of small business owners who can't wait as well for us to fully reopen so they can bring back a lot of their clientele, rehire a lot of the staff. As we know, many small to medium business owners have really struggled with the restrictions during the pandemic. Now, the province announced that their relaunch grant for businesses has been extended until June the 30th. Can you explain really how that works? Yeah, again, it's, it's for businesses that have been hit the hardest, right? And they've, they've lost 30% uh, or more of their income. They can apply. They can receive up to 15% uh, or, or a maximum of $10,000 for reimbursement. And I believe that they can apply two or three times, maybe even more than that now. Uh, it, it can't fully replace all that they've lost, but we're trying to help them out every way that we can to make sure that they can open up, they can get back to work, and hopefully they see a, a strong resurgence in local support for their businesses to, to gain that income back. It's, uh, it's been a tough time. We, we applaud how hard they've worked, but we want to see them get back on their feet. So what do you say to the business owners who lost everything, who had to close their doors, and they're not coming back? You must have talked to some of those business owners like I have right here in our community. I have. It's absolutely devastating. Uh, it's something I hope I never have to see again. It's not, it's not what I got into government for. Um, I hope that every single one of them can, can find resilience and, and find uh, their way back to ownership and small business. But really, there's no words to, to share with that kind of grief uh, and what they poured their life into. And um, it's a very difficult situation. So hopefully we can see that minimize and, and come to a stop. Although uh, there have been many that have, they've just had to close the doors, which is, is not uh, where we want to end up. That's for sure. Yeah, you know, a lot of business owners I've spoken to as well, they say it's like a family member died when they have to shut down their business. A lot of these businesses have been around for 30, 40, or even 50 years. Now, Nathan, the Alberta government says more than 22,000 Albertans will be able to get back to work through the largest jobs training program in Alberta history. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, that, our government has dedicated $370 million, along with some uh, part of that funding is from the federal government, to help people and help small businesses hire new people back and hire staff back. So this will supplement some of their wage. I believe it's a, a, a one-year program with some funds up front, and then they have to check in regularly along that year to continue to access those funds. That's to really help those job creators uh, do what they wanna do, but giving them some support. As you know, we've had a depressed economy. It's a lot of risk for employers to hire new employees right out of the gate. But we're saying, listen, we believe that you're going to make money. We're going to give you some help up front to get these people back to grow your business and, and see that last over the longer term. I want to talk to you about a bit of a touchy subject here. The arrest of three Alberta pastors during the pandemic. Isn't Jason Kenney the only Canadian premier who had a pastors arrested for breaking public health restrictions? I mean, Pastor James Coates from Grace Life Church near Edmonton spent 35 days behind bars, Nathan. 35 days, and most recently, Alberta Health Service is shutting down Fairview Baptist Church and arresting Pastor Tim Stevens in Calgary. Now, John Carpe from the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms called the arrest illegal and said it should have just been a fine. Where do you stand on this? Well, it's not something I would like to see either, and I, I don't like that Alberta has that reputation. Uh, the government doesn't have a hand in directly uh, authorizing arrests or any of those kind of things. Uh, although we do set those restrictions in place. But throughout the entire pandemic, Alberta is one of the only provinces in all of Canada to always have maintained at least some level of uh, access to church and religious freedoms. Many provinces shut churches down completely for long periods of time. And uh, definitely we don't want to see this uh, as a trend. I am thankful that out of tens of thousands of places of worship in Alberta, Really to have only three is a, a very small number. I'm not minimizing the impact or, or the stand that those uh, people have taken, but I do hope that we can come to a resolution. We can come to agreements that ultimately this is about protecting people and their lives uh, against a virus that has gone around the world. So hopefully with the restrictions easing, we can all get back on the same page and see them open and flourish again. You know, what's interesting too is when I had that conversation with Pastor James Coates from Grace Life Church, he said, this isn't a decision he made on his own. 
He took it to the board, the elders, they all talked about it, they prayed about it, and the importance of talking to a lot of the congregation and reaching out to them and the need in the community, especially during the pandemic, with anxiety levels and depression levels going through the roof, they needed to reach out and, and minister to them more than ever. So this wasn't just like an off-the-cuff thing that he decided to do. So that's what makes it tough, I guess, for you as well, being a believer, is like, you know, where do you stand on this and how do you go with it when they believe they were led by God? Yeah, and, and if they stand on principle and accept the consequence for their actions, then they'll work that through and it will get resolved and, and worked out and worked through. I'm glad to see that he's out uh, of, of prison and helping people again. Uh, the government that doesn't absolve the government from their responsibilities, which are trying to protect people's lives. And uh, obviously a very challenging situation. Nothing new in the history of the world, Hal. Uh, I'm sure church and state have, have had conflicts before. Uh, but again, I'm looking for towards the future for better days and uh, those freedoms fully restored in every capacity. Yeah, open your Bible if you want to hear about more Christians being thrown in jail. You know, there are a few examples cited there too. Now, last time we chatted, you said you were going to reach out and chat with Alberta Justice Minister Casey Madu to discuss his thoughts on Lethbridge Police Chief Shaheem Medizadeh's plan to clean up the LPS. Have you spoken with Minister Madu? Is he satisfied with what he read? Yes and yes. I'm, I'm very pleased that the, the Minister of Justice uh, has accepted that plan. There are elements in it that he wants to absolutely ensure are addressed and looked at and identified and, and then managed and acted upon. So he continues to work with Chief Medizadeh and the Lethbridge Police Service, but I believe that we are heading in a very good direction and uh, addressing some very needed issues for, uh, for Lethbridge. But again, I stand strongly behind the work that Chief Medizadeh has done and the Lethbridge Police Service and their members they have, they have really come to the plate to say, hey, we're, if we've made a mistake, we're willing to stand up and, and fix that. And they just want a fair, uh, fair address in that process. And I think the Minister of Justice has now seen that they're willing to be part of that solution. And again, we're moving in a great direction. Looking forward to days ahead. Did Minister Madhu give any specifics as per what really needs to be approved upon in regards to the report, like maybe transparency or other issues? Uh, not to me at this point. I think, again, his department is working with the Lethbridge Police Service and they didn't want uh, those details to get out ahead of time, uh, ahead of the process. So again, uh, I'm not privy to that right now, but he is working closely with the Lethbridge Police Service and Chief Medizadeh, and I'm confident that, that uh, the steps will be taken that need to be taken. Nathan, there's an advocacy group calling itself Mom Stop the Harm, which would like to see a certain amount of drugs decriminalized and more drugs made available to those who are battling addiction here in our city. What are your thoughts on both points as the opioid crisis continues in our region? Sure, I, I do understand that, uh, that approach, but I unfortunately don't think decriminalization actually addresses the underlying issue, which is the challenge of addiction. And that's where our government has really focused on uh, supportive housing, on recovery, on treatment, and, and taking the next steps. So while I will let higher courts and other uh, advocates uh, debate the, the merits of decriminalization, again, I don't feel it fully addresses the challenge of addiction. What does address that challenge of addiction is those supports that get people into treatment and recovery, surrounds them with good people, to get them on a different path and get them out of that life of addiction. And that's where I think our government has placed our resources, our time and our efforts. And I, I believe we are seeing those numbers come down in Lethbridge and I'm very proud about that. The province recently announced an investment of $1.2 million to support survivors of sexual violence. Now, how will it do so? And what kind of support will be made readily available here in Lethbridge? So there's, there are a lot of fantastic organizations that provide care and support and shelter for those who have been uh, uh, harmed in this way. And the, the Chinook Center for Sexual Assault in Lethbridge, I hope I got their name right. Uh, I have met with them. They are a fantastic organization. Uh, counselors, psychologists, very highly trained staff to really take these individuals, work with them, make them feel safe, get them into a safe place, safe housing, and really put them back on their feet. I think it's a vital service, and I'm very proud that Lethbridge has uh, a resource and a facility that has received some of these funds and will help these people in need. 
The union representing Alberta teachers gave a non-confidence vote to Education Minister Adriana Lagrange. Now, the Alberta Teachers Association has not been impressed with the new curriculum, Nathan. Now, is this just political posturing by the union and its members, or is there maybe a little more to it? Well, let me say this. I do know that 100% of the NDP members don't support our Minister of Education either, but we're still the government because that's the will of the people of Alberta and the majority vote there. Democracy uh, might not be a perfect system, but it's the best system that we've got. So we will continue to work with that and we will continue to find uh, and the, hear the voice from everyday Albertans, the, the parents of children in school, the children in school, and yes, teachers as well, uh, to make sure that we continue to work on that curriculum. I believe there are some things that need correction, but a lot of parents like the, the classic uh, fundamental education system as well. So we wanna move in that direction. Uh, I think politics, uh, we're very used to all kinds of opposition, uh, particularly from loud and vocal groups like unions, uh, like the ATA. But we'll continue to move forward and hopefully we can see uh, the greater public and the, the general voting population come to understand what's in this curriculum and how we can make it better for their kids. You know, some of the First Nations groups we've spoken to as well said that they want to have more of a voice in the new curriculum too. That was a big factor as well. Now, you were part of a task force to provide foundational change across Alberta's student transportation system. Your group put a plan together to make improvements to student transportation while ensuring the safety of both drivers and students. Really explain what that will look like. Sure, it, that was uh, an incredibly uh, challenging project and yet uh, very satisfying. We worked with a board of 23 individuals from all, all different walks of life in the educational system, from uh, key people of the Edmonton Public School Board, all the way down into people from Lethbridge and area across our great province. So we looked at the, the challenge. Um, Years ago, we would have lots of tiny schools all over the place. So literally, kids would just walk down the street to their neighborhood school. As we've seen Alberta grow and our population increase, those school buildings don't migrate. They stay in the same place. So we've had to add to them. And now we have much larger schools, but people have to travel further. That's the inherent challenge here. So some of the suggestions put forward uh, are twofold. One is again, more schools in more locations so that that travel uh, distance is mitigated, uh, but as well, realizing that there's no one size fits all. We have an incredibly diverse province from fantastic and majestic rural areas to our two booming uh, uh, metropolitan cities. Very similar issues, whether it's safety or travel or time on the bus, but very different circumstances. So trying to thread the needle on all of those different aspects for the same topics was, was indeed challenging. We've put forward a number of recommendations uh, that has been made public, and we'll continue to work that out, hopefully with some short-term goals, mid-term goals, and then longer-term goals. And uh, we could talk longer about that, I'm sure, but uh, that's where we're going. Nathan, I know you're a very busy MLA. You sit on how many committees? Like 15, 20 committees? <laughs> yeah, it's over 20 now. Not all committees, but over 20 appointments, yeah. That's, that's incredible. And now you're the new caucus chair for the UCP. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, we... Uh, thank you very much, Hal. I appreciate that. Yeah, we've had uh, challenging times. Uh, we all know that Alberta is diverse and... Uh, We've seen uh, a member step down. We went through a democratic process within our caucus and I was elected by the, the vote of the membership to be the new caucus chair. And that's really to help coordinate and develop the relationship between private members such as myself and the leadership, which is the premier and cabinet. We wanna do that. We wanna make sure that every view is respectfully presented and considered and really uh, work together as a team as we hold together uh, the unity of the Conservative movement and our United Conservative Caucus. Well, caucus chair today, maybe one day tomorrow, a minister. Lethbridge East MLA, Nathan Newdorf, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Helen, take care. Does God still speak to people today? There are differing opinions on this topic, of course, and there are also many different thoughts on who the Holy Spirit is and how he operates in our lives. 
Today's guest has some thoughts and experiences that she'll be sharing with us. Gina Napoli is the author of Clunk on the Head, How the Holy Spirit Got Our Attention. And she's joining me now from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Gina, to the show. So great to have you on. Thanks for having me, Jeanette. Glad to be here. Absolutely. I love the name of the book, by the way. Can you give us a little snapshot of what your book is all about? Sure can. My book is an anthology. It is a compilation of 28 different stories by 12 different authors. And all of us have had some sort of direct interaction with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit had been nagging me for years to put this book together. But the, I would say the first few times I had those direct interactions with the Holy Spirit, I really was afraid to share. I thought there's going to be a paddy wagon and a bunch of men in white coats coming to pick me up and put me in the back or something. So I, I kept those to myself for a long time. And then it became increasingly obvious that the Holy Spirit was giving me signals that I needed to write these down, to share them, and to also get others to share their stories as well. And that gives the story a little bit, or excuse me, that gives the book a lot more, I'd say, integrity. It isn't just one crazy eccentric woman out in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, having these uh, voices talk to her or something like that. The Holy Spirit is real, and it is, and is the voice of God, the conduit of God, trying to talk to us. Now, you mentioned that sense of knowing. So what do you mean by that exactly? The, the only way I can describe it is you just know. And I know that's not really helpful. That's kind of like the way I asked my mom, how do you know that you love dad? You just know. Uh, the Holy Spirit has different ways that he, he reaches out to us. And it's the way God chooses. It's not certainly not the way or timing sometimes that, that I would wish to know. Um, sometimes it's, the Bible says it's that still small voice that that whispers into your heart, that gives you a message from God. In my case, sometimes it was a poke on the shoulder. Sometimes it was, um, one time it was my child uh, speaking, speaking to me from the back of a van, uh, just really blatant times where the Holy Spirit was making his voice known. And I know that just in talking to the other authors about their clunk moments, for them, it was that sense of knowing that peace in the Bible, it says that peace that transcends all earthly understanding. Um, and a lot of times too, it's the, I know when it's my own voice, I hear, I tell myself what I want to hear. And the, and God isn't like that. God asks us to do very hard things. And sometimes it's him asking us to do something that maybe we wouldn't rather do. So when you hear that voice saying the opposite of, of what you yourself want to hear, then you know that's God. That's God's voice. Interesting. And I do think you give some examples of that in your book. But do you think that, that we often, we sometimes miss God's attempt to communicate to and through us? Like you said, you might just think it's your own conscience or voice. Sure. And I'm going to blame a hurried society on that. Uh, lots of distractions. Uh, sometimes we don't take the time or even make the time for reflection. And that's so important. That's so important to take a step back and think about your day or think about those moments where, where God was trying to tell you something or evaluate how you could have done better in a situation. Uh, what is God asking you to do? Uh, we, most of us have uh, two income households, at least we, we do here in Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, just trying to economically trying to keep our, our heads above water. So raising kids and in that sandwich generation of also looking after our parents, sometimes there aren't enough hours in the day at times to, um, it, you know, you make it to church once a week formally if you're lucky. So really taking that time out and um, from the, the business of being a human doing rather than a human being. It really is so important, and it's a step that a lot of us do miss because we don't take the time or make the time. Mm -hmm. How can we know the difference between God trying to get our attention or just coincidences or even delusions? I know you kind of talked a little bit about that. Yeah, and I, 
that, that is a tough one. Um, something that God really put on my heart was to pray for discernment. And there are a few verses about discernment that um, I know spoke to my heart that are in the Bible that um, I, I did want to share with your, with your viewers if I could. One of them is Psalm 119, verse 125. I am your servant. Give me discernment that I may understand your statutes. And another one is from Psalms. I do like to read a lot of Psalms. I find a lot of wisdom there. And this one is Psalm 77, verse 12. I will consider all of your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. And that speaks to taking that time to reflect and um, understanding, praying to God for wisdom and knowledge. Is this, is this my voice? Is this your voice? What will you have me do, Lord? Mm -hmm. Now, you were also saying before that he sometimes tries to get our attention through other people. How did he do this for you? I know you mentioned your daughter. Uh, my daughter was a big player in one of my stories. This was probably about 11, 12 years ago. I was at a crossroads in my life. I was trying to jump from one federal agency to another agency. I was working for a micromanager at the time. And I don't know if your viewers have ever had this experience, but when you're working for a micromanager, it feels like you're getting squeezed and you're just not your best self. So I was praying daily, almost hourly to try to make a change. And I had three different interviews set up with this particular agency that I wanted to work for. And I got very cocky. I, I, I'm ashamed to say I, I lacked humility in my life at that time. And I thought, I'm going to go on all three interviews and I'm going to get all three of those jobs. I'm going to get three phone calls and three offers and, you know, look out me. And lo and behold, I went on all three interviews and my phone sat silent. I didn't have the ringer off. I checked with the phone company. No one was calling. So I was going to work in the morning. I accepted that I wasn't going to get those jobs. And I was dropping my daughter off before I went to work. And I, I hovered over the steering wheel and I gripped it really tight. And I prayed, Lord, please give me a sign. If I'm going to work for that agency in the future, would you please give me some sort of sign? Let me know that you're there. Let me know that you hear me. And I had the radio all jacked up and, you know, I was having a good cry at the time. And my, my daughter, I could hear her yelling. I thought, what the heck? And she's like, mom, mom. And I turned down the radio and I said, what? What could you possibly want? And she said, mom, I said, the answer is yes. And I had to jump back for a minute. Like, what did you just say? Now, I, I, have, I should mention she was about three years old at the time, yeah. <laughs> three to five. And I, she said, I said, the answer is yes. And I knew that that was God right there because I had that radio turned up so loud. There was no way she could have heard me. Oh. And I, I ask her about that now. She has no recollection of that oh. happening. Yeah. Doesn't know why she said that. <laughs> and I know that that was God through the Holy Spirit coming down through her to, to give me a message. <laughs> now, Did because you... I think my life is a movie, um, uh, <laughs> I thought, oh, the phone's going to ring immediately. But it didn't. <laughs> It took about eight months, took about eight months. But during that eight months, I reflected back on that time where God gave me that message. And that gave me hope. That gave me the hope I needed. So I did get the job or get a job at that new agency. And it was a better fit than the other three. And I went in with a humble heart. So I, I think that was a, I, le I left that experience changed. And that was a, I think a more important part of the story to me is that God used that to transform me somehow. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes, like they say, when he closes the door, he opens a window. And sometimes you just have to wait for it because you're just not That waiting ready. is hard. It's the hardest. How do we know for sure when God is speaking to us? That's just the age-old question, isn't it? <laughs> like I said, discernment. And um, I, I'm, I guess, more of a Martha than a Mary. And I want my answers now, darn it. I, I want 
God to give me those signals. I want I want God to tell me what it is I'm supposed to do. And those aren't his ways. I think I, most I really of us wish are they like were that. his ways. Yeah, we're in such a fast, you know, fast paced, fast food world, if you would, right? That yes. it's hard to be patient. So Gina, how did you finally learn to let go and not try to control those outcomes? I'll let you know. <laughs> Actually, that's that's not true. I right now I am in a job that I could see myself sailing through out to out to retirement on. Um, but it, it took me a while to get to this point. And there are times that, you know, I'm, I'm mid career. I have some time to go before I retire. So I I flirt with alternative realities. What will God have me do? And I, I have prayed about it. I I do have to say that since the book was released. I haven't had any of those moments with the Holy Spirit. I haven't had any interactions. So I'd like to take it as a sign that uh, the, the Lord is patting me on the head and saying, good job, good and faithful servant. You've done what I asked you to do. I don't know. I, I try to remain open, keep my heart and spirit open for the next time the Lord reveals something to me. And I don't know what that is yet. Now, Gina, you were told that you couldn't have children. So how did God speak into that sad news? Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, that, that was a really low point in my life, too. And it was probably about 16 years ago. I do celebrate the day that uh, a doctor called and, and gave me that news. Um, but I, I was told by a different doctor, a, I call him the know-nothing doctor, that I would never be able to bear children. And it was a tremendous sense of sadness that, that descended on me. I had had pictures that would flash in my mind from the Holy Spirit about having one daughter. And I even had a mental picture, like a school picture of what she would look like. And I, I have to say that the, the daughter looked nothing like me. So it was sometimes confusing when this, this little face would pop in. She had black hair, which I don't have black hair. She had big brown eyes, uh, mine are blue, and uh, perfectly pale white skin, which at times I do have. So, you know, maybe I could claim her. Uh, but when I, I had some stomach pains, and when I went to the doctor, they, she said, you know, just on a hunch, I'm going to give you a blood test. And when she did, I, I found out I was pregnant. And I had so many emotions. Um, but the main one that came out was that that God was faithful, that he kept showing me that picture through his Holy Spirit of a child I was supposed to have and did not let me down with that. And it, and it was a path that I thought for sure was closed to me. And I think about all those ladies in the Bible. Now, they, they were a lot older than I was when they got the news that that they were going to have children, you know, Elizabeth and Sarah. And um, they had given up probably the same way that I had given up. And so it's it's just so wonderful that God can do whatever he wants. <laughs> he really can. And um, he gave them that news through the Holy Spirit as well. He, he let them know that something big was going to ha be happening in their lives as well. Yeah, absolutely. Now I got to ask, does your daughter look anything like that snapshot of that picture that would appear into your head? She did. <laughs> she did. Really? And not for nothing, my husband, <laughs> he looks just like him. Oh, that's amazing. Well, Gina, your book encourages us to be open to God speaking to you and through us. So any tips for how we can be more open to his leading? I know you kind of answered that already. I, I did want to say one, one, something about my book, if I could, um, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic, because so many of us are feeling so disjointed and, and very disconnected from each other. I mentioned I am more of a Martha than a Mary. Uh, the way I designed the book was so that it could be read in groups. They're all very short chapters. They're 28 of, well, actually, I think there are 30. There's an intro and a, and a call to submission because I'm looking for more of these stories from people. I want to get that ripple effect going where I, I know there are a lot of people who have had interactions with the Holy Spirit and probably are keeping it to themselves the same way I did. Um, I, I'd love to hear from from everybody who's had that sort of experience where the, the Holy Spirit spoke into their lives. I, I also designed the book as 
uh, the kind that you would do in church together uh, with your small groups. You, you read a chapter and then you come in, there are discussion questions. There are also exercises. So it isn't meant to be something where you're just receiving, you're going out and making that ripple effect into the world. And I think just coming out of the pandemic, we need those connections right mm-hmm. now, probably more than ever. More than ever, absolutely, yes. Thank you so much, Gina, for sharing your stories and your wisdom. And thanks so much, of course, for being with us today as well. Thank you, Jeanette. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Gina Napoli is the author of Clunk on the Head, How the Holy Spirit Got Our Attention. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.